European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen suggests that profits from frozen Russian assets could be used to purchase weapons for Ukraine. She emphasizes the need for Europe to enhance its defense capabilities and increase ammunition production. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has also called for utilizing immobilized Russian assets to support Ukraine's defense and reconstruction efforts. Von der Leyen warns of the possibility of a wider war and stresses the importance of Europe taking responsibility for its security. The EU is preparing to present a comprehensive defense strategy, including proposals to boost defense production and fund joint military projects. Efforts to apply a windfall tax to immobilized funds are underway. Amid concerns about Russia's intentions and doubts about U.S. commitment to European security, von der Leyen emphasizes the need for European unity. She advocates for supporting the EU's defense industry and establishing a designated defense commissioner role. Additionally, the EU plans to open an office for defense innovation in Kiev. Recent discussions among European leaders, particularly at a meeting hosted by French President Emmanuel Macron, have focused on strategies to address Ukraine's ammunition shortages, including plans to purchase ammunition from outside Europe. A Ukrainian official expressed welcome for the idea of European nations sending troops to Ukraine, indicating an awareness of the risks posed by Russia. French President Emmanuel Macron raised the possibility but noted a lack of consensus among European leaders. The statement came during a meeting in Paris aimed at demonstrating European solidarity with Ukraine and countering Russia's narrative of inevitable victory in the ongoing conflict. The Ukrainian official emphasized the need to accelerate the delivery of military equipment to Ukraine. In response, the Kremlin warned that such actions could lead to a direct conflict between Russia and NATO, stressing the seriousness of the situation. However, the United States clarified that it had no plans to send troops to Ukraine, and there were no plans for NATO troops to do so either. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has criticized the Ukrainian peace plan, developed with the involvement of world leaders, calling it an ultimatum. Lavrov expressed concern over statements indicating that the plan would be refined without Russian involvement and then presented to Russia. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has previously expressed skepticism about the possibility of achieving true peace through talks with Russian President Vladimir Putin. Zelensky proposed a platform where Putin could acknowledge his mistake and defeat in the war. The Ukrainian president's office announced plans for a global peace summit in Switzerland, with invitations to leaders of over 160 countries, but no invitation is expected to be extended to Russia initially. Russian representatives may be invited to a subsequent summit or the peace plan will be presented if they show genuine willingness to end the war. Dmitry Peskov, spokesperson for the Russian president, warned that the presence of NATO troops in Ukraine would inevitably lead to a direct conflict between NATO and Russia, escalating the situation. He emphasized that this assessment is based on the Kremlin's evaluation of the situation. Peskov acknowledged the discussion among Western countries about the possibility of sending their military to Ukraine but noted a lack of consensus on the matter. He also referenced President Macron's position on the need to inflict a strategic defeat on Russia. French President Emmanuel Macron has not ruled out the possibility of sending Western troops to Ukraine in the future, but there is currently no consensus among allies. Polish President Andrzej Duda stated that Kiev's allies have not agreed to send troops to Ukraine as Macron suggested. Additionally, Czechia, Poland, and Sweden have stated that they are not considering the idea of sending their troops to Ukraine. France reported that one of its Mirage 2000 fighter jets intercepted a Russian IL-20 reconnaissance and surveillance aircraft near the coast of Estonia. The interception was conducted as part of France's commitment to protecting the airspace of its Baltic allies. French military aircraft are deployed in NATO member states under the NATO Air Policing Mission, which aims to safeguard Alliance airspace, particularly since Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. While there have been several interceptions of aircraft, there have been no serious incidents. In March 2023, a Russian aircraft collided with a U.S. drone in the Black Sea. French Defense Minister Sebastian Lecornu recently stated that Russian forces had threatened to shoot down French aircraft patrolling international airspace over the Black Sea. During a press conference following a Visegrad Group summit in Prague, Czech Prime Minister Petra Fiala acknowledged disagreements among the leaders of the four countries regarding Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the type of aid to provide. Fiala mentioned that Czechia and Poland are sending military aid to Ukraine, while Hungary and Slovakia opt for financial and humanitarian assistance but refrain from sending weapons. 
Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban called for urgent peace talks, which Fiala disagreed with, emphasizing a firm stance against aggression. Slovakian Prime Minister Robert Fico expressed support for Ukraine's independence but emphasized the need for security assurances for both Ukraine and Russia. Polish Prime Minister Donald Tusk urged for unambiguous support for Kiev and rejected immediate negotiations, emphasizing the need for a clear assessment of the situation. The Prime Ministers of Slovakia and Hungary faced protests in Prague over their positions on Russia's war against Ukraine. Earlier, Slovakian Prime Minister Robert Fico had attributed Russia's actions to Ukrainian neo-Nazism and expressed concerns about Western support for Ukraine. Hungarian lawmakers have elected Thomas Suliak, the chief of the nation's constitutional court, as the next president following the resignation of Katalin Novak due to a child abuse scandal. Suliak, who has led the politicized top court under Prime Minister Viktor Orban, received 134 votes in the 199-seat parliament, which largely consisted of Orban's lawmakers, as most of the opposition boycotted the election. Orban rushed the vote to move past the political crisis, emphasizing the need for stability in the country. Novak's resignation over a controversial pardon risked damaging Orban's political agenda and reputation. Despite ongoing protests, which were smaller than earlier demonstrations, Orban appears to have weathered the affair. The president of Hungary is elected by parliament for a five-year term and holds a primarily ceremonial role. Leaked military documents reveal Russia's doctrine for tactical nuclear weapons use, indicating criteria for their deployment. These weapons, designed for use on the battlefield in Europe and Asia, have a more limited range compared to strategic nuclear weapons. The documents, dating from 2008 to 2014, suggest a threshold lower than publicly admitted by Russia. Criteria for use range from an enemy incursion on Russian territory to specific triggers, such as the destruction of strategic assets like submarines and surface warships. There is also an indication of distrust toward China, with military exercises envisioning a hypothetical attack by China in Russia's eastern military district. The leaked documents may provide insights into Russia's strategic considerations and potential concerns about conflicts involving Ukraine. The Ruby Mar, a British-registered cargo vessel carrying 22,000 tons of fertilizer to Morocco, was hit by a double rocket attack by Houthi rebels in Yemen. New photos show the extent of the damage, with the vessel sinking in the Red Sea. Fortunately, there were no crew members on board, as they had been evacuated immediately after the missile strike on February 18. However, the ship began leaking fuel, raising concerns of an environmental disaster. The Saudi-backed Yemeni government has requested United Nations assistance to prevent a spill from the cargo. Efforts are underway to bring a work ship to close the hole caused by the missile, but there has been no further update. Shipping risks in the region have increased due to repeated Houthi strikes since November, which they describe as acts of solidarity with Palestinians against Israel in the Gaza war. Despite US and British responses, including strikes on Houthi facilities, the attacks have persisted. The Houthis have indicated they may reconsider their missile and drone attacks on international shipping in the Red Sea if Israel ends its aggression in Gaza. They have also sent formal notices banning vessels linked to Israel, the US, and Britain from sailing in surrounding seas. The Yemeni government has warned of the danger posed by the Houthi militia, citing their planting of sea mines and use of drone boats and missiles. Iranian officials have reportedly urged proxy terrorist groups they support in the Middle East to reduce attacks on the U.S. to avoid a more direct conflict with the American military. This shift followed the U.S. response to an attack that killed three U.S. soldiers in Jordan. The U.S. retaliated with strikes, prompting a decrease in Iran-backed attacks on U.S. forces in Iraq and Syria. Analysts suggest Iran fears a direct confrontation with the U.S. could lead to war and harm Tehran and its allies. Iran supports various factions in Middle East conflicts, providing financial and military aid to groups like Hamas in Gaza, influencing Hezbollah in Lebanon, and supporting Houthi rebels in Yemen. Brig General Esmail Ghani, commander-in-chief of the Iranian Quds forces, reportedly traveled to Iraq to discuss new plans with militia leaders to avoid outright war with the U.S. Meanwhile, Israel is preparing for a final major operation against Hamas terrorists in Rafah, with a quarter of Hamas forces estimated to be in the area. Israel has assured civilians will have the opportunity to evacuate before the attack. The United States has imposed sanctions on the owner and operator of a crude oil tanker, the Koana, which is en route to China to offload more than $100 million worth of Iranian goods. 
The Treasury Department identified the vessel as carrying cargo from Iran's Ministry of Defense and Armed Forces Logistics, accused of facilitating the delivery of Iranian weapons, including drones, to Russia and Iran-backed militias in the Middle East. The Hong Kong-registered Koana Company and Marshall Islands Registered Iridescent Co. Limited were blacklisted for owning and operating the vessel, respectively. Under Secretary of the Treasury Brian Nelson stated that Iran's Ministry of Defense is engaged in schemes to fund destabilizing activities, including aiding Russia's invasion of Ukraine and supplying weapons to militia groups attacking U.S. forces. The sanctions are part of efforts to disrupt illicit revenue generation supporting destabilizing acts. Additionally, the U.S. and Britain have targeted Iran-backed Houthi militia with blacklistings for their attacks on military and commercial vessels in the Red Sea. The sanctions freeze all property and interests of those blacklisted and prohibit U.S. persons from doing business with them. According to a top Pentagon official, the United States has conducted airstrikes on 230 targets in Yemen in response to Houthi-led attacks against shipping in the Red Sea. American forces also intercepted ships carrying lethal aid from Iran to the Houthis, including drone components and missile warheads, which Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense Daniel Shapiro described as a clear violation of international law. Despite the strikes destroying hundreds of Houthi weapons, the group remains committed to sustaining maritime attacks with their remaining inventory. This testimony, along with remarks from U.S. Envoy Tim Lenderking, marks the first congressional testimony by U.S. officials since President Joe Biden ordered strikes against the Houthis last month to end their Red Sea attacks. Additionally, U.S. Central Command announced the downing of five Houthi one-way attack airborne drones in the Red Sea, indicating ongoing military action in the region. U.S. President Joe Biden has stated that Israel has agreed not to engage in military activities during Ramadan in the Gaza Strip, where it is in conflict with Hamas militants. Biden mentioned that Israel committed to allowing Palestinians to evacuate from Rafah in Gaza's south before intensifying its campaign there. The president indicated that there is an agreement in principle for a temporary ceasefire between the two sides, with the goal of securing the release of hostages. Biden believes a ceasefire could improve relationships with Israel's neighbors and pave the way for a process leading to a two-state solution for Palestinians. He highlighted the potential for recognition from Arab countries like Saudi Arabia. Jordan, and Egypt, emphasizing the need for a process that guarantees both Israel's security and Palestinian independence. While aiming for a ceasefire by the following Monday, Biden warned that Israel risks losing support globally if the conflict continues, citing concerns about the high death toll among Palestinian civilians. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu responded to President Biden's mention of a possible ceasefire in Gaza by asserting that a majority of Americans support Israel continuing its campaign until victory. In a video address, Netanyahu emphasized his efforts to gain support for Israel and curb pressures to end the war prematurely. He cited a Harvard-Harris poll showing over 80% of Americans supporting Israel, which he interpreted as additional strength to pursue absolute victory. Netanyahu's remarks came a day after Biden expressed hopes for a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas, aiming for the release of remaining hostages by early next week. Netanyahu previously mentioned that an Israeli offensive in Rafah could be delayed if a ceasefire deal is reached, but he believes total victory in Gaza is weeks away once the offensive begins. Talks towards a deal have resumed at the specialist level in Qatar, one of the mediators in the conflict. Economy and Industry Minister Anir Barkat, a potential candidate to succeed Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, emphasized that Israel is committed to winning the war in Gaza and eliminating Hamas, regardless of the economic toll on the country. Israel's economy, with a $500 billion GDP, has been impacted during the four-month-old war against Hamas, leading to workforce shortages as many people joined the military. Barkat stated that national security is paramount and vital for Israel's economy. He mentioned a commitment to borrow in the near term, acknowledging that this would increase the debt-to-GDP ratio. However, he expressed confidence in the post-war economy's growth, fueled by an innovation boom in Israel's high-tech sector. Barkat highlighted collaboration with peaceful countries globally against Iran, Hezbollah, and Hamas as part of the future strategy. He indicated that Palestinian workers could return when the Palestinian Authority enacts reforms, including ending stipends to families of militants. Barkat met his Saudi counterpart during a visit to the UAE and noted that future collaboration involves peaceful countries worldwide. While expressing confidence in Netanyahu as prime minister, 
Barkat did not confirm whether he intends to challenge him for the leadership of the Likud party. Israel began its offensive in Gaza after an attack by Hamas militants, resulting in a significant number of casualties on both sides. The U.S. State Department expressed its desire to avoid further escalation of tensions between Israel and Hezbollah, emphasizing the need for a diplomatic solution. Department spokesperson Matthew Miller stated that Washington is pursuing diplomatic avenues to address the security threat faced by tens of thousands of Israelis in the north. He noted Israel's public and private assurances of seeking a diplomatic path, with the goal of making military action unnecessary. The comments followed Hezbollah's announcement of launching rockets at an Israeli aerial surveillance base, in response to Israeli military actions in Lebanese territory. Israeli Defense Minister Yov Gallant previously mentioned plans to increase attacks on Hezbollah if there's a ceasefire in Gaza until Hezbollah withdraws from the border. Miller highlighted Israeli officials' preference for a diplomatic resolution, despite Defense Minister's statements. Israeli strikes since October have resulted in civilian casualties in Lebanon, along with Hezbollah fighters' casualties. Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. expressed concern over the presence of the Chinese Navy in the South China Sea but affirmed his country's commitment to defending its maritime territory and supporting its fishermen. The Philippine Coast Guard reported the sighting of Chinese Navy vessels during a patrol mission by a Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources BFAR, vessel at Scarborough Shoal. The BFAR vessel, which was shadowed and blocked by Chinese Coast Guard ships, also provided fuel to Filipino fishermen in the area. Despite these challenges, Marcos emphasized the Philippines' unwavering support for its fishermen and vowed to continue assisting them despite attempts to block or shadow their activities. The Philippines is seeking closer trade and investment ties with the United States amid concerns about China's potential use of economic influence for coercion, according to Philippine Ambassador to the U.S. Jose Manuel Romualdez. Tensions between the Philippines and China have escalated due to disputes over the South China Sea, leading to concerns about potential economic repercussions for Philippine exports to China, such as bananas and nickel ore. In response, the Philippines is looking to diversify its markets and strengthen economic relations with the U.S., which has expressed commitment to expanding investments in Philippine infrastructure, manufacturing, and energy sectors. Romualdez emphasized the importance of the U.S.-Philippine Security Alliance under President Ferdinand Marcos Jr., highlighting joint military drills and defense cooperation. Additionally, Romualdez discussed the U.S. stance on the Indo-Pacific region, highlighting the South China Sea as a major flashpoint and calling for ASEAN's involvement in deterring China's actions. He also noted that constitutional reforms in the Philippines could facilitate increased U.S. investment in the country. Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. is considering holding a referendum to amend the constitution alongside the midterm elections next year, citing potential cost savings. Marcos aims to revise the 1987 constitution to attract more foreign investments and boost economic growth. The proposed changes, supported by Speaker Martin Romualdez, require public approval through a referendum and majority support. However, the plan has faced opposition, including from former President Rodrigo Duterte, who accuses Marcos of attempting to extend his term beyond the current six-year limit. Marcos argues that the Constitution, ratified after his father's ouster in 1986, needs adjustments to adapt to the globalized world and stimulate economic activity. The Chinese government has expanded the state secrets law for the first time since 2010, broadening the scope of restricted sensitive information to include work secrets. The revised law on guarding state secrets was passed by China's top legislative body and will take effect from May 1. The term work secrets appears to broaden the law's application, covering information not classified as state secrets but considered sensitive and capable of causing adverse effects if leaked. This expansion aligns with President Xi Jinping's emphasis on national security and follows last year's update to Beijing's anti-espionage law. China's government defended its Coast Guard patrols around Taiwanese islands, dismissing complaints about the boarding of a Taiwanese tourist boat as causing panic. China reiterated its stance that it does not recognize any off-limits waters around the Kinmen Islands for fishermen. The Coast Guard's actions were described as carrying out official duties to maintain normal order and protect lives. Taiwan has expressed concerns about increased pressure from Beijing following the election of Lai ching -e as president. Taiwan's defense ministry reported Chinese military aircraft operating around the island, conducting joint combat readiness patrols with Chinese warships. 
China accused Taiwan of causing the deaths of two Chinese nationals on a fishing boat and blamed Taiwan for dangerous enforcement actions. Tensions between Taiwan and China escalated as five Chinese Coast Guard ships entered prohibited or restricted waters around Taiwan's Kinmen Islands on Monday. The incident occurred amid heightened tensions following the recent election of Lai ching te as Taiwan's president, viewed unfavorably by Beijing. Taiwan's Coast Guard promptly warned the Chinese ships to leave, underscoring the political significance of the situation as a declaration of sovereignty. Kinmen, strategically located near China's coast, has been a flashpoint in cross-strait relations. Despite Taiwan's military presence there, it is the Coast Guard that patrols its waters. The Taiwanese government emphasized its commitment to safeguarding fishermen's rights and maritime safety, insisting on standard operating procedures in handling such incidents. However, Beijing has accused Taiwan of acting maliciously in the past, exacerbating tensions between the two sides. The departure of China's shortest-serving foreign minister, Qin Gang, from the country's top legislative body has been officially confirmed, as reported by the Xinhua News Agency. Qin's resignation from the Standing Committee of the Tianjin Municipal People's Congress comes after his abrupt removal from the foreign minister position in July, just seven months into the role. Despite speculation about the reasons for his departure, no official explanation has been provided by Beijing. Qin's resignation means he loses immunity from criminal prosecution, although he has not been formally accused of any wrongdoing. He was initially said to have skipped international diplomatic gatherings due to a physical condition. But subsequent reports suggested an investigation into an alleged affair during his tenure as U.S. ambassador, potentially posing a national security risk. However, no official inquiry has been announced. Qin's removal and the dismissal of other officials are seen as part of routine personnel changes rather than indicating a shift in China's policy, according to statements from Chinese diplomats. Qin still holds a position on the Communist Party's Central Committee, underscoring his continued involvement in party affairs despite stepping down from his governmental role. The Chinese Foreign Ministry's Arms Control Department, represented by Sun Xiaobo, suggested that states with the largest nuclear arsenals should negotiate a treaty on no first use of nuclear weapons against each other or make a political statement to that effect. Sun called on nuclear weapon states to fulfill their special and priority responsibilities for nuclear disarmament, emphasizing the need for the UN Conference on Disarmament to define a roadmap or timetable for an international legal instrument protecting non-nuclear weapon states from nuclear threats. Currently, China and India are the only nuclear powers with a formal no-first-use policy, while Russia and the United States have the world's largest nuclear arsenals. Sun also called for a universal, non-discriminatory, non-proliferation export control order and emphasized addressing global security challenges in biochemistry to maintain the authority of the arms control treaty system. Additionally, he urged the Disarmament Forum to respond to emerging scientific and technological challenges such as artificial intelligence, outer space, and cybersecurity. Sun characterized the international strategic security situation as facing new challenges due to countries with the strongest military power breaking treaties to seek their own absolute superiority. Former Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison, in his final speech before the nation's parliament, criticized China and described it as part of an arc of autocracy, alongside Russia, North Korea, and Iran. He warned future governments not to be naive about the threat from China and emphasized that while tactics may change, the strategy remains the same. Morrison's leadership saw a deterioration in relations between Australia and China, marked by trade sanctions imposed by China in response to Australia's call for an international investigation into the origins of COVID-19. The comments come amid efforts by the current Australian government to repair relations with China. Serbian President Aleksandr Vucic expressed firm support for China's claim over Taiwan, stating that, Taiwan is China, during an interview with Beijing-based CGTN. Vucic's remarks come as he announced that Chinese leader Xi Jinping will visit Serbia this year, underscoring the close bond between the two nations. The visit, confirmed during talks with Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi, is expected to create a positive atmosphere for one of the most important world leaders. While the date of Xi's visit was not provided, it marks his first trip to Europe in over four years, highlighting the significance of the occasion. China and Serbia have cultivated closer ties in recent years, with Beijing providing aid to Serbia during the pandemic and both countries cancelling tariffs on a significant portion of tax items under a new free trade agreement. 
Additionally, a new yuan clearing arrangement between China and Serbia aims to facilitate more cross-border transactions using the Chinese currency. Hong Kong activists from the League of Social Democrats staged a small protest outside the Hong Kong government headquarters against the proposed Article 23 security bill. This protest comes amidst a visit by senior Chinese official Xia Baolong to the city. The activists voiced concerns about the lack of democratic oversight in the government's decision-making process regarding the security legislation. Chief Executive John Lee, however, stated that he received positive feedback from the business community about the proposed legislation, citing support from representatives of foreign chambers during a closed-door meeting with Xia Baolong. Xia's visit to Hong Kong coincides with the city's efforts to revive attempts to enact the security law. Raising concerns among investors about its potential impact on open discussion and economic issues. Despite assurances from Xia that the one country, two systems policy will remain intact, Beijing's crackdown on dissent in recent years has raised questions about the future of Hong Kong's autonomy. The proposed security legislation, along with Beijing's imposition of a national security law in 2020, has prompted criticism and led to an exodus of residents from the city. South Korean Defense Minister Shin Wansik has stated that North Korea has shipped containers to Russia that could hold millions of artillery shells. He estimates that about 6,700 containers have been sent, with each capable of holding approximately 3 million rounds of 152mm shells. The pace of shipments reportedly increased after a summit between Russian President Vladimir Putin and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un in September. Shin Wansik mentioned that Russia is providing North Korea with food, raw materials, and parts used in weapons manufacturing, stabilizing prices for necessities in North Korea. However, concerns have been raised about the potential impact on the region's security if arms transfers between North Korea and Russia continue to grow. The increased collaboration between North Korea and Russia is seen as a new partnership that has evolved since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, with Pyongyang providing ballistic missiles, artillery shells, and other military equipment to support Russia's aggression. The collaboration is viewed as mutually beneficial, with North Korea receiving economic support and Russia gaining access to munitions that are interoperable with its deployed weapons in Ukraine. The arms transfers could allow North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un to strengthen his position and shun engagement with the United States while enhancing capabilities in satellite deployment and nuclear arms development. North Korea's first spy satellite, Malajiang-1, is alive and under Pyongyang's control, according to a Netherlands-based space expert, Marco Langbroek. Changes in the satellite's orbit, specifically the recent maneuvers to raise its perigee, indicate successful control. The satellite, launched in November, had faced doubts about its functionality. Langbroek notes that the maneuver to raise the satellite's orbit is significant, suggesting North Korea's capacity to prolong its operational life. While the exact capabilities of the satellite remain unknown, North Korea has claimed that it can photograph sensitive military and political sites. The country plans to launch three more spy satellites in 2024. A federal judge in Lubbock, Texas, ruled that lawmakers unconstitutionally passed the $1.7 trillion government funding bill in 2022 under a pandemic-era rule allowing members of the U.S. House of Representatives to vote on the matter by proxy instead of in person. Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton, a Republican, sought to block a provision of the funding bill that provided stronger legal protections for pregnant workers. U.S. District Judge Wesley Hendricks, appointed by former President Trump, issued a limited ruling blocking the enforcement of the Pregnant Workers' Fairness Act against the state of Texas as an employer. Hendricks ruled that the federal spending package was unconstitutionally passed, noting that over half of the House members were not physically present to provide a quorum, yet they voted by proxy. The ruling may have implications for legislation passed using proxy voting during the COVID-19 pandemic. John Stewart recently addressed the Israel-Hamas conflict on his return episode of The Daily Show, expressing condemnation for Israel's bombing of Gaza and criticizing the Biden administration's response. Stewart proposed a sincere idea for resolving the crisis, suggesting a plan involving Israel stopping bombing, Hamas releasing hostages, and Arab countries forming a demilitarized zone between Israel and Palestine to guarantee security for both sides. While Stewart's idea received some support from Middle East experts, it also faced challenges and complexities. House Foreign Affairs Committee Chairman Michael McCall, a Republican from Texas, has threatened to hold Secretary of State Antony Blinken in contempt of Congress for failing to hand over key documents related to the U.S.'s withdrawal from Afghanistan. 
McCall accused Blinken of prioritizing politics over policy and criticized the State Department's decision to withhold the documents. The issue revolves around interview notes used to compile the State Department's after-action review AR, of the Afghanistan withdrawal. Despite multiple requests from the committee, the State Department has not provided the requested documents. McCall emphasized that the documents are critical for the committee's investigation into the withdrawal. The Afghanistan AR placed blame on both the Trump and Biden administrations for the chaotic withdrawal, highlighting insufficient consideration of worst-case scenarios and the decision to hand over control of Bagram Air Base. Fox News Digital reached out to the State Department for comment but received no immediate response.